You're listening to Bring Me the Axe. I'm Brian White, one half of this morbid equation, and I'm joined by my co-host and my actual brother, Dave. Hey, Dave, how you doing? Whoa, uh, thank you for asking. Uh, I am shook, shaken, and disturbed by the news this week. I don't, I don't care for that. What's, uh, what's... You, got, you got all this stuff in the news. You got a Maryland bridge collapsing. You got uh, a P. Diddy sex trafficking. <laughs> That's true. You have Trump selling Bibles with Lee Greenwood for some reason. <laughs> You've got a new Beyonce country album. Yep. And sassy Joe Biden on social media. Yeah. How yeah. does one process all of these things in a seven day span? Um, you do what I do and you kind of just go, you kind of look at it and you go, huh? Yeah. That's, and, that's <laughs> pretty much what I do. I look at it and go, God damn it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, things reached a, a sort of peak, peak weirdness. Um, I'm, I'm going back to about 2012 and I'm convinced that, that the Mayan calendar actually reached its conclusion okay. and the, the world, the entire, the world as we know it ended, the universe has come to an end, but it has not realized it yet. And so we are just living in its death dream and it's never going to end. And it's just going to keep spiraling out, getting weirder and weirder. And shit's just going to keep getting more strange. It's going to compound in strangeness uh, day after day, week after week, year after year. You remember that show wife swap? Yes, I do. Yeah. This is not even a tangent. Uh, I remember one where one it was like a, a you know totally normal mother or whatever gets dumped into this family of preppers who were convinced oh, shit. they were convinced that uh, the Mayan calendar was a real thing that the world was going to end. So what they had done was they had run up this insane amount of credit card debt. Oh my god! <laughs> and built like a bunker and were like hoarding all this food and shit. And so the woman was like, I don't know how to connect with these people, much less get through to them. And so what she did was they found like a, a, you know, some sort of expert. I think they lived in like Colorado or something. So they, well, they weren't that far from the border, wherever it was. So probably maybe not Colorado, but Arizona, maybe something like that. And he was like an expert in Mayan history. And so he comes over and, and the guy was like, Hey, look, you know, the, the Mayans, they were right about everything. And the, the, the history guy was like, well, yes, the Mayans were right about a lot of things, but they were wrong about a lot more things. And those are the <laughs> things you don't hear about. <laughs> did it, did it get through to them? Uh, a little bit, actually, All if right. I remember correctly. And the guy was just like, Oh, but we, we, we spent all this money. <laughs> and the, uh, the, I mean, I think by that point, the, you know, the history guy had left and uh, the woman was like, I guess it sucks to be your family. Oh, man. It sucks to uh, be uh, led by you. Yeah. Good God. A friend, a guy that I worked with, he was uh, he was an illustrator, a comic book artist, and he was offered a producer reached out to him and was like, we'd like to interview you and your family to see if you guys would be a fit for this. Would you be interested? Is this rich? This is rich, yeah. And yeah. he said, um, and and he was like, I really don't know how I feel about this. I think it would be great exposure. But then he sort of explained the circumstance. And um, you know how that show always had like the straight family and then the weirdos, like yeah. the preppers and shit? Well, they were, pre it was very obvious that they were poised to be the weirdos because like the straight family's illustrator was like an architect. And I was oh, like, we're just swapping illustrators. Yeah. And so I was like, do not go on that show. They will make a fucking fool out of you. And so thankfully, thankfully he, he did not. I, <laughs> he I don't know why it. I watched a lot of that show at one point in my life. And I'm just going to say, uh, I was probably really depressed. <laughs> it should also be said, I, I, for a while had a problem with alcohol. So those two things probably happened around the same time. <laughs> It was, yeah, it was on that. It was definitely, it was, that was the show that was on the news. Uh, uh, certainly at the time, because, you know, I was going through some shit also. It was a dark time for everybody. It was. Everyone was just like, hey, why don't we all just, you know, snuggle in, watch a little wife swap, and, uh, you know, thank your lucky stars you're not them. Oh, God, I know. That's really what it was, wasn't it? Well, thanks, everybody, for tuning into the wife swap <laughs> podcast. <laughs> No. Oh, God. Yeah. Hey, uh, we practically grew, grew up in neighborhood video stores and the steady diet of utter garbage that those shops provided us with continues unabated to this day. There's no one else I enjoy chopping it up with more about trashy movies than Dave. Just before we get into it, here's a little housekeeping. If you want to keep up with us between episodes, you can also find us on Instagram at Bring Me the Axe Pod. And Dave's over there at That Queer Wolf. Mm -hmm. We have a good time. We have fun. You know, you should follow us if you do the Instagram thing. Uh, we've also got a sweet website now at bringmetheaxe.com. You can listen to all our past shows there, read the transcripts. 
I wish you would. I do not like to be misquoted. I know. it's Everything is on the record forever. It's cemented on the internet, man. It's facts. Yep. And if you don't know, we have another show called 99 Cent Rental, where we cover all manner of video store madness on the weeks that bring me the axes off. Our latest episode covering Sunset Boulevard is out now. And uh, uh, just as an aside... I think that's our best episode of all, both of these podcasts. Wow. I think it's our best one by a fire. Okay. Yeah, I love it. I encourage you all to listen to it. Um, and we'll be back next week with a look at Walter Hill's almighty The Warriors. Yeah, I am very much looking forward to that. That movie fucking rules. Yeah, God, I cannot fucking wait to talk about that one. You can also contact us directly at bringmetheaxpod at gmail.com with any questions, comments, or suggestions. Do let us know if there's a movie that you love and would like to hear us give it the business. Lastly, if you like what you hear, you can subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. We're on YouTube now. Search for us by name. Subscribe if you prefer to consume your podcasts that way. And you'd be doing us a favor by leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. What are you waiting for? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Just do it. It's simple. It's simple and it's helpful. And it, it really goes, it goes a long way for us. And if you listen on YouTube, do us a favor, give the episode a like and leave a comment. We love hearing from you guys. I just want to get that all out of the way right at the top of the show because I'm going to give you a taste of what we're talking about tonight. <laughs> Ooh, Jesus Christ, this fucking movie. Here's a taste. They come from the unknown and they're here now, hiding waiting to strike you can feel their presence all around you never before have you come this close to the edge of terror Never before have you faced anything so strange and sinister, so bizarre and unnerving. Never until now. David Cronenberg's The Brood. Are you ready for me, Frank? I seem to be a very special person now. I'm in the middle of a strange adventure. I want to go with you wherever you go. Do you? Yes. Then look! The Brood. You can run. You can hide and hope they won't find you. But you won't escape. Once unleashed, the brood will destroy anyone who gets in their way. David Cronenberg's ultimate experience in inner terror. Starring Oliver Reed and Samantha Egar. The brood. They're waiting for you. So there it is. The Brood. David Cronenberg's The Brood. This is my favorite Cronenberg movie, hands down. No shit, because I was going to ask you, what's your favorite David Cronenberg uh, it's, movie? It is this one, it followed this one? closely by Rabbit. No shit. Yeah. Wow. I, that's, 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 cut. that's unexpected, because I, I, do, I do like those, those, those early ones, and I do enjoy this one quite a bit. But I think my, my favorite, I think, is really is pretty basic. It's, it's Videodrome. I like Videodrome. I think what, what kind of ruined, I mean, and Videodrome was never going to be one of my favorites, but even if it were, I think the, uh, what's his face? Who's in that fucking movie? Well, I can't remember his name. James Woods. Yeah, James Woods, real piece of shit. Uh, he kind of ruined ruined that a little bit for me. Yeah, yeah. There, there's definitely a few of those actors out there that when I see them and like just because of their behavior on Twitter and shit, yeah, I I, I just I can't fucking look at them the same. But I, I don't know. I I'm able to let Videodrome slide. Um, uh, you know, James Woods is a real fucking piece of garbage. Yep. But yeah. yeah but I, I mean, a, I I guess Cronenberg himself is also well. He's a complicated person. I think. He's a complicated man. He seems well liked, which I think says a lot about. It. Have you ever read his book, Cronenberg on Cronenberg? Mm-hmm. I have not. When did I, it came out? Not too long ago, right? No, I, I think that one came out in the nineties. Mm. When he wasn't doing much, his fallow period. <laughs> uh, yeah, 
put yeah. out existence uh, and everyone was like, maybe you should write a book. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Because it was, I think it's early 90s. I might be wrong about this. I'm, I'm just speculating. Because during the, that, that one came up across my radar when I was doing the research for all of this. And I, I realized I had not read it. And I think that, I think the, the day, I, I'm going to, I'm not going to commit to that because I'm probably wrong about the date. But yeah, his, his 90s period, not a fan. I'm not big he's on a, his later movies. I mean, I like them. Uh, and I see them. I see that they're good, but they just don't do the same thing for me. He's got eras. That's the weird thing. It's mm -hmm. like this early period is very schlocky. It's him kind of feeling out what he's what he's trying to trying to ultimately get to. And then he really kind of hits it. I think this movie is the movie that is kind of the flashpoint for the rest of his career. Yes. Because after this, he really kind of figures it out. We get scanners and fucking Videodrome and the Dead Zone and like he just he figures it out and then after Dead Ringers, he kind of fades and he goes runs through out of this gas a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's and it's weird. These guys not the nineties is not without its is not without its hits. I like Crash a lot. I like Crash I, too. I think it's fucking weird as hell. I love it, but also the th I think the thing that really that really gets me because Cronenberg is definitely one of my all like my top favorite like directors and a lot of it has to do with the fact that he seems to he seems he's a big fan of jg ballard and mm -hmm. so am i and also also a notable piece of garbage <laughs> but i i love his novels and i love that right from the get-go because he jg ballard wrote crash didn't he the story yes yeah yeah yes yeah, so, but like and so fi that's finally when cronenberg kind of gets to do his own riff on on ballard proper because prior to that there's a couple of movies where it's him kind of trying to do it. Like Sh is Sh Shivers is the one where everybody goes goes that's horny the in the one. in the building. Yeah, that's that's like him. Like he had ju he must have just read High Rise. Yeah, I think High Rise came out at the same the same years that movie came out, and he was like, "I'm gonna do that." And the distributor was like, "Can you make it sexy though?" Yeah, could you? He's put, like, you I know, don't. What do you? He's like, I don't know. Things that invade people's bodies and it's real sexy. And he's like, I don't know how you make eating a dog sexy. So like that's. Uh, that's the, <laughs> that's that's that. But he eventually kind of figures it out. But you can see like touches of Ballard throughout a, a lot of his a lot of his stuff until the '90s hit. But then then there's that moment where I think it's I think the first movie that really kind of marks the twist, the turn in his career, and it was a history of violence. I saw it. I don't mm -hmm. really like that one. I'm and not everything a big, that, What's his Vigo Mortensen? I don't really like him that much. I think that he's might good be in it. that movie, but I don't, I just don't care for him as an actor. It came out like when he was, it was like kind of on the heels of the success of Lord of the Rings. So yeah. he was just like in everything at the time. Yeah. Yeah. I, that might, that might've been it. But also that movie, I, I read the comic before it came out. I, I'm just, I'm, I didn't I mean, really like that It's just a straightforward either. drama. It's not, you know, and that's fine, but like there's, it's kind of an action-y drama and that's about it. And I, I think, think the, the thing that, about it that I don't care for is you don't expect, you don't, you expect more from Cronenberg. Yeah. And it's really just a, like a story of a man who's, who's past catches up with him. And it's like, there's other fucking movies that do this. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I don't know why he settled on. Because he's such a smart person. Like he's, you can tell he's a very intelligent man. And that kind of, uh, it is, it pervades all of his movies or at least his earlier ones where it's like, these are weird concepts to begin with. They're already kind of fringe science concepts. If, if, you know, science at all, usually science fiction. And he kind of takes them to a, a totally unexpected and usually disgusting place. And I think that's what makes him really cool. I, you know, he's like, um, you know, John Carpenter is sort of like, I mean, obviously very different style, but like he is similar in that way where it's like he had a lot of ideas and it's a lot of really forward thinking shit and really creative. And then he just kind of runs out of juice. Yeah. Like maybe, I don't know, maybe some of these guys, they just, they've got just a little bit of gas in the tank, but what they're able to do with that is, is crazy good. Cause he has a fucking awesome run in the eighties. Like mm -hmm. it is just back to back bangers. Oh, uh, but, uh, yeah, before we get, before we get too, too far ahead of ourselves, shall we do the facts? Yeah. All right. The year was 1979. Yes. The year of our Lord. So here's some other movies that were released in 1979. Alien. Oh. Was released in 1979. Oh, my, my, my. Right, real good movie right there. Phantasm came out in 1979. Okay. It's also a fine film. Yeah, I love it. Zombie, the Fulci film, came out in 1979. I'm not going to call it a fine film, but I enjoy it. <laughs> it's a good movie. It's fun. 
1979 also saw Tourist Trap. I love that movie. I love that one. Love it. I wonder, that's a movie where I really wonder how they pitched that to Chuck Connors. Like, maybe they just wrote a number on a, on a check and were like, here. I feel and he like was like, I a, need that money. It's. I think it's probably more like how they used to get John Houston to do weird shit. Like, how you get John Houston to do tentacles? Is you're like, hey, uh, John Houston, you, you want to go on vacation in Italy? <laughs> you got to work for like three days. And he'd be like, all right, but I'm going to wear my bathrobe the whole time. And they're like, yeah, yeah fine. That's sure. cool. Sure, that's cool. Uh, yeah, and lastly, rounding out 1979, Dracula, the Frank Langella version. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Which that was the very first version of Dracula that I ever saw. That is a that is not a good film. <laughs> nope, nope. But uh, nope. Expect more uh, Frank Langella talk on 99 Cent Rental in the near future. Uh, so here we go, cast and crew. The director, as we mentioned, David Cronenberg. Arch Canadian, mm-hmm. one of my favorite horror movie directors, as I said. This is his fourth feature and a movie that I consider to be, as I said, the flashpoint for his entire career. I bristle at the uh, the mention of the the phrase body horror, though. For this or for anything? Just for anything. Because I feel like it's it's sort of like those the way that people kind of like create like arbitrary horror movie subgenres now, like fucking folk horror. Where oh, if, like, yeah, a movie, you don't, you don't like, like that a, phrase, huh? No, like if a movie takes place in the woods or something like that, they're like, oh, this folk horror classic. Yeah. You know, like it, it's what usually when people are talking about a body horror movie, what they're talking about is David Cronenberg in the 70s and the 80s. I think they're talking about The Fly and then retroactively applying that label based on that movie because that movie is truly a body horror movie. You watch a man's body transform. Yeah. And yes. it's fucking disgusting. But yeah. I think to go back and then like retroactively slap it on other stuff, especially this movie. This is not, this is barely a horror movie. The, um, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a few horrific scenes, but it's mostly uh, b- b- people failing a child over and over and over again. It's basically- people, it's everybody failing everybody over and over. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think that they, and even I think going forward, like the fly is fucking gross. There's no, you know, it is a disgusting movie, but I don't think the, I mean, I guess scanners, but there's not that many head explosions in scanners. It only happens once or twice. Um, but otherwise he does some gross shit. You don't see coming a lot or there is weird body stuff occasionally. Yeah. But th- the, the term, you know, like a uh, like horror is a body genre, in that it you know it typically revolves around like fear that something will happen to you your to your person. Yeah, but it's not like he, you know, it's not Frankenstein. It's not about like grossing you out by tearing people apart. So yeah, I don't think it really it doesn't really apply except for the one movie. No, but it's it, the thing is is like I mean the the lots of his movies do have these do have these touches that are. Uh, like that, you know, your body is constantly cha- is changing in really strange ways, threatening, terrible ways. Like it's 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 most pervasive in the fly because that's what the movie's really about right. is a guy who fucks up and you know his it turns. And into that's a, also a not fly. his story. I mean, if that is a remake, so yeah, right, right. right. Uh, you know, there's a lot of it in Videodrome. Yeah, but the thing that that I think that really kind of bugs me about people just sort of like applying this topic, this name is that really this kind of horror, these manifestations of his really kind of like fucked up visions and fantasies is uniquely his own. Yes. Like and there are some metaphorical movies. metaphorical too. Oh yeah. 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 Like there's some movies that also do this. Like society has that big scene at the, at the end. That yeah. Everybody that's fucking body horror. For. That's what that is. Yeah. But like, there's just, it, it, it's often used in a way that like implies that there's a broader bo- body of body horror, you know, and there, right. there really isn't. What you people are usually talking about are Cronenberg movies. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, um, I don't know. I, I just I, I wish it, it seems like it's something that is very unique to him. And I it's it's more like just call it a Cronenberg movie because that's really his that's his vibe. You know, I also love that he. He does not shy away from Canada. And I, well, we're going to talk a lot about Canada in this. Ooh, uh, this is a very Canadian movie. Because he embraces, he's one of very few people that does not go out of his way to make you think this is the U.S. As a matter of fact, a lot of the time, it's very explicitly in Canada. Yeah, yeah. This one is specifically set in Toronto. Yeah. And yeah. so I, I've always appreciated that. He also seems very 
supportive of other filmmakers. And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I love I love the fact that he shows up as a villain in Night uh Nightbreed. Yeah, he's also in uh Friday the 13th 10. Yeah. Um yep. I think he just like he likes to support other filmmakers, which is really cool for someone who's that well established to really go out of their way to do something like that. And he just seems to have a really good sense of humor in general. He doesn't seem to take himself that seriously. Uh, this film, notwithstanding. No, the vibe of his movies are almost universally morose mm -hmm. and f it's all like flat and sad, but he, everything you hear about him is like, he's a funny guy and he's really smart and he's nice. And like, not a bad word is ever spoken about him, you know? Yep. So uh, here's our, here's our cast. Oh boy. Yep, we've got Samantha Agar, mm -hmm. whose full name is Victoria Louise Samantha Marie Elizabeth Therese Agar. That is that is thoroughly British. That is as British as it gets. Uh, she was a well-known English actress. She's probably best known for her role in The Collector, the adaptation of the John Foles novel that inspired a whole bunch of serial killers. Mm -hmm. uh, at this time in her career, things are starting to trend downward for her. She shows up in this low-budget affair, The Exterminator, and then back to Canada for Curtains. Yeah, Curtains. She's also in yeah. Demonoid. Yeah, yeah. Which is a fucking terrible movie. <laughs> yeah. Her presence is heavily felt in this movie. She was on set for four days. Yep. She's barely in it. It's crazy. Because when she is in it, she you, you cannot look away from her. The, oh, man. So I suppose well, I'll save it for when we, we actually start to get to her. Cronenberg sh shoots her in a very specific way that is very weird. And I, I really want to talk about it. Uh, so let's see. Uh, supporting her is Oliver the Eagle Reed. There's the Eagle. Yep. To find out why we call him the Eagle, you're going to have to listen to our Burnt Offerings episode where our guest Sam Pancake tells a story that blew our fucking minds. Yeah. <laughs> yep. yeah. Oliver so, Reed, notorious piece of shit. Uh, great actor, though. Yeah. Yep. He is, I believe you said Scotch personified. He really, and everything <laughs> you see him in, it just looks like he, he is just sweating. Yeah. He is barely there. You could practically see the ethanol vapors just emanating from him. It's rough. Yeah. Yeah. He's uh, he's a fucking great actor, though. A according to the Eagle, this is the best script he'd ever read up to this point since The Devils. Wow. Yeah. Have you ever seen The Devils? I love The Devils. That is probably... I think that might be the most upsetting movie I've ever seen. <laughs> it, is it's, so, it makes me so sad and angry. And it is something. a historical drama. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I love when it sounds like shutter. I'm like, this is not a horror movie. It's not even remotely close to a horror movie. This is a real story. Yeah. No, I fucking God, I love Ken Russell. Man, uh, that's... What is, uh, Art Hindle. And I, the thing, one of the things I watched Art Hindle, uh, describes Oliver Reed in, in this movie. Cause the, the guy was like, well, what's it like to work with Oliver Reed? And he was like, he is off the wall <laughs> know, and disingenuous. And I was like, oh, that sounds right. <laughs> That's the yeah. That's that one. Uh, meet the Carveths on yeah. the on the Criterion disc. I watched that last night too, and that that line caught me off guard. And I was like, "Is that a compliment?" No, I don't think it is. I think that's his kind of polite Canadian way of being like, "That guy fucking sucks." <laughs> yeah. Art. Speaking of Art Handel, Art Handel is rounding out the cast. He's the star of the movie. He's ah, making Chris. this. Making his second appearance on Bring Me the Axe, he's also in Black Christmas as Chris, Claire's hockey play and boyfriend, mm -hmm. and, he works, and he works with Bob Clark an awful lot. Takes he's the directing, Porky's, isn't he? Yes, and he's also in that uh, that that was it called From the Hip? It's got Judd, Judd Nelson. It's like oh, right, yeah, yeah, yep. right before his his big fall. Yeah, yep. he's also in Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which I forgot about. I had forgotten about too, but he plays a small part. That's yeah, he's the not. Thing. It seems like in a lot of the, the when people interview him, they talk it up, and it's like there are really four stars of that movie, and he's not one of them. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. He, uh, you know, he he's a director, he's an actor. He continues to stay pretty busy to this. He is day. in a lot of Hallmark movies, and you know who loves Hallmark? I do. That's right. That's right. He is. I'll tell you what. I I had never. I'd not really known much about him, but watching him on all the supplements for this on that Criterion disc, he is a fucking funny guy. I was not sure what to make of him because it's sort of like, it's hard to tell whether he wants to be there. I mean, I'm sure he doesn't want to be there, but like, it's hard to tell if he's taking it seriously or sort of like fucking with him a little bit. Like, 
in that the one where it's uh, him and the woman who plays Cindy, he's just like sitting there eating popcorn. It's like, dude, <laughs> the popcorn is a fucking prop, man. You're not. They gave him. To- they gave him popcorn. What's he supposed to do? Not eat the popcorn? He's They're sitting there a- crankling the bag and like. <laughs> He's like a jerk at the movies. The, the, the sound guy must have just been furious. And they're like, nope. You get you get Chris for five minutes. You just yeah. you shoot it and you don't look back. I thought he was funny as hell. I think he's a, he's a very charismatic guy, uh, and he's great in this. He's he really he is he really, really good is. in this. I think everybody's really good in this. Well, the, yeah. maybe not everybody, but <laughs> so we get some taglines here. The ultimate experience in inner terror. <sighs> I inner, know these taglines the inner terror part that it's like, what, what the fuck does that mean? I know that the, the taglines on this are fucking bullshit. Um, here's another one. If they get your hands on you, you're better off dead. <sighs> See, this is all. This is why, why I asked you earlier if this was distributed by New World, because it's they're pitching it as a horror movie when it's like, yeah, I don't really know what to call it, but I wouldn't call it that. <laughs> Divorce core. Yeah, it really <laughs> is. Yeah. Uh, and here's the last one. Experience ultimate terror in a film so frightening it will totally devastate you. I I, I just, I, if someone said that to me, I'd be like, get away from me. You know, the, here's the thing. If somebody was like, here's the script, like, what's, what's it, like, come up with some taglines for this, I'd struggle to. I, I'd come up with one that would be like, Divorce really sucks. Yeah, I mean, what you do is you take the fucking the uh, uh, his famous line. What does he say? That this is uh, it's like his. This is his version of Kramer versus Kramer, but, <laughs> but real. But real, yeah, yeah. So uh, here's here's a little tri- here's a little trivia for you. The budget for this movie was one and a half million dollars. Uh, a lot of it was provided by the sort of uh, Canadian uh, arts endowment that fun they got going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, it turned a pretty healthy box office. Five yeah, million. I think this is so. We we have in, in the past we've talked about Canadian movies. Uh, yeah, I around, think we talk. I think we talk about the tax shelter era in our Black Christmas episode. Black Christmas, and I think also, or maybe uh, Rad, or uh, My Bloody Valentine as well. Ooh, that's the one that we did. But this, yeah. I think, because in both of those episodes, we probably talk about how uh, can, the Canadian film industry was constantly trying to like find the one that was going to make it big in the American market. And it was like, they kept, you know, it was supposed to be black Christmas or it was supposed to be my bloody Valentine. And it wasn't really either. I think it is this that actually does it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Cause uh, that's the thing is, is the tax shelter, uh, does exactly what you kind of expect it to do. Like they probably, like, I know why they did it. And it was to sort of like draw filmmakers to them yep. and um, empower filmmakers well, it was to drop it, money to filmmakers. Yes, yes. But what happens is because you've got this loophole and it's it's the sort of thing that's designed to be exploited, it drew exploitation filmmakers yes. who just made schlock and shit. And a lot of it's a lot of it's good, you know, so it's it's good garbage, but they didn't it didn't really have the effect that I think the that that the that the Canadian government was expecting, wise, which is why it only lasts like five or six years. Well, there's also a bunch of people who take the money and make very Canadian movies. Yes. I mean, like yeah. you get Denny Arcan who's, who's will eventually go on to win a bunch of Oscars. But before that he's making like, you know, crime films that are very specifically French Canadian movies. So I think people are sort of like, hell yeah, I'll take your money. And it's like, then they just go and, uh, you know, make some French Canadian movie about uh, <laughs> life, life as a kind of a low, low end mob guy. Yeah. But uh, this, but to your point, this is definitely a sort of an exception to the rule because, like, he gets some quality actors, and turns out a movie that is way more sophisticated yes. than its contemporary. Now, people did not think so at the time. Critics, oh, we can get into. We'll get into some some. Well, I can't. I can't wait to hear because I saw some. I saw some some lines that were vicious yep. about this movie. Yeah, but I, it was originally it was supposed to be a Cinepix movie. And for some reason, because Cinepix oh, put good. out the first couple, Cinepix uh, was a big, yes. uh, like the the Canadian uh, kind of lower end distributor uh, for like specifically Canadian movies. They put out his first two, or maybe his first three, even. I don't know. If Fast Company, probably. Fast I don't. Company. I, yeah, I don't know where Fast Company lands. Um, and they were supposed to put this one out, and something kind of fell apart. And I think it. Everyone seems very vague when they talk about it. It seems like part of it is a funding issue, but part of it is like a personality issue. So then okay. Roger Corman gets involved and, you know, New World takes it over. Yeah. 
Yeah. So the tax shelter laws, I, I did not know this until, until I, I looked this up. It affords filmmakers two non-Canadian cast members and stipulates that one of them has to be paid less than the leading Canadian actor. So Cronenberg gets Agar and Reed to fill those roles in order to sort of appeal to international audiences. I can only imagine that Art Handel got paid more than uh, Samantha Agar. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. Oliver Reed is not the one getting stiffed on this deal. No, plus, plus Reed is in the movie way more than she is. Yeah. Uh, so its original title, this uh, The Brood was not its original title, at least not its original shooting title. Its original title may have been Chromosome 3. Which is what it's known as overseas. I believe it's sold in France that way. At least in parts of Europe it was. Uh, the producer, Pierre David, claims that he was the one who came up with the title, changed it from whatever that was it was titled originally. And then uh, most importantly, this is the first uh, collaboration between Cronenberg and composer Howard Shore. Yeah. Yeah. And the, sound, the, song, the soundtrack, pretty good. It's a Bernard Herrmann ripoff, but it is still very good. Everybody is just ripping off Bernard Herrmann. I mean, because time. there is there are film scores before Bernard Herrmann and film scores after. Yeah. He is the, you know, and they all, anything after is going to sound just like him for the most yeah. part. I think this one's pretty good. I like Howard Shore's music a lot. Um, I like the stuff he did specifically with David Cronenberg quite a lot. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he he eventually comes into his own. Like, the stuff that he does with Cronenberg in the 80s is really fucking good. I mm-hmm. love the soundtrack for Scanners and Videodrome yep. and The Fly. And it's just the guy really wins. Um, yeah. Uh, it's that, you know, stabby, high tensity kind yeah. of like, uh, you know, way up high on the tiny strings of the violins. <laughs> So uh, yeah, uh, it is. So this is kind of central uh, to our to our thing to the whole movie here. It is well known that this movie was the product of a very nasty and messy divorce between Cronenberg and his ex wife, Margaret Hinson. Uh, it's hard to know the details of the story since it's a, it's a pretty personal thing for Cronenberg, who will ironically leave it all on the dance floor with this one. But the, well, yeah, it is pretty much this movie. Yeah, like you would think this is like a you know a stretch or something, and nope, this is really kind of what happened. I had a really hard time finding the sort of specifics of it because I'm not sure if the specifics are out there. It's just all so anecdotal someone stuff. else kind of fills it in a little bit. In uh, I was hoping there would be like a uh, you know director commentary or something, and I understand why there wouldn't be. Like if if you were David Cronenberg, you probably wouldn't want to like have to talk about all this again anyway. Right? Because I get the feeling that at the end of this movie. He got this shit out of his system completely. Yes. Um, his, so what What happened basically is that it is essentially what happens in the movie is they get, I think his ex-wife's family is like really overly involved in whatever their divorce thing. It becomes very messy. And his wife got sort of roped into this like um, new age. Like a self-help s- cult. Yeah. And she took their kid to, and it's sort of in the middle of nowhere. And, and she took their kid and like moved there. And he had to go and like kidnap the child to get them out, which I think led to some real legal problems, yeah. uh, which are kind of represented in this movie. And I think that's also why uh, this comes across as a little bit misogynistic or may, I don't, we can talk about that in a minute, but yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot to um, a, a lot going on there. But I think, yeah. So that really, this is kind of what happens is she gets in with this group. That's basically a cult. Um, and he is sort of like recognizing that being in cults is not usually a good idea. He tries to get their child back and, it doesn't really go very well. It takes, I think it's a really long, hard process. He does sort of win in the end, but it, it, you know, it takes quite a long time and it sounds like it was very painful for like everybody involved. I mean, yeah. you know, divorce generally is anyway. I think this is a good moment though to explain. So I, the more I was thinking about this as I was watching it is because we get to the inevitable question at the end about how this sort of works now. And I, this movie is so much a product of its era that if you don't understand the era, this is not going to make a lot of sense because the, the, what is being represented by Oliver Reed's character and this sort of Soma free Institute is it, this movie comes out 
at sort of at the end, not really at the end, more like the middle of that era where boomers are sort of breaking out on their own. And it's the, the sort of confluence of new age ideology and ideas being kind of lumped in with like normal psychiatric uh, treatments or psychotherapy to that, that gives these ideas a little bit of legitimacy, even though they're total nonsense. Yeah. The seventies is a re- uh, unsurprisingly, this is the downside of the sort of hippie wave. Like we are now like fully like 10 years away from, from Manson and the kind of the, the high watermark and the, the sort of receding of the tide. And so things are really fucked up. Vietnam's over. Everybody's really kind of feeling it. Everybody is soul searching. And so this is a period of, but still doing it in that way of, uh, of the kind of like hippie era where we're rejecting the norms of our parents. And so in yes. doing that, they start to embrace these kind of wacky kind of the, these new age I- ideas, which, you know, they're, I'm not going to go off on it. You know, I would like to, but I won't. <laughs> um, but yeah, cults are, are humongous. Like probably about a year away from the production of this movie, like Jonestown is yeah, it's one year before. 78 78 is a fucking nightmare for america yeah but also like i mean like the depths of of this sort of new age new human potential movement is uh, like really strange because it's it's even in the fucking army like this is the this is the age of the first earth battalion the shit's about to get really strange and then jonestown kind of puts the fucking cooler on it. But I mean, so there are some that continue to thrive too. I mean, there's some that still exist now in really different forms, but it's the idea that, uh, you know, everyone is feeling bad for various yeah. reasons that are pretty easy to identify. The government's a fucking nightmare. Uh, you know, you don't know who to trust anymore and everybody yeah. hates each other. You know, it's all, it's, it doesn't, it's not a coincidence that this is all happening at the same time that various civil rights movements and kind of radical movements are coming about because it's, it is essentially what's happening now where you have a lot of sort of the people who were in power, but didn't realize it are kind of like, Hey, why are you saying we're bad? And it's like, well, I don't know. (laughs) Uh, But so there is a lot of bad feeling in America and in, in obviously in Canada too. Um, and so you get these clash of things where they're like, we're going to reject all the old ways because that didn't work. And it's like, well, it didn't work because you wouldn't actually make it work. And instead they go for these kind of fantastical beliefs. You know, where you get, this is where you get a lot of like psychic mediums and shit like that. It's like, if you guys would just confront your fucking emotions, you could solve these problems. But that is basically what this movie is about is nobody wanting to address what's actually happening and instead pretending it's not and looking for some other solution. Yeah. Yeah. Nowadays, they would call it generational trauma. Yes. And I mean, yeah. uh, what I think is really interesting about this is that Cronenberg obviously recognizes this, that there is a cycle of trauma and there's a cycle of abuse uh, and that if you do not actually confront those things, they will kind of start to eat you alive. But he stops at psychotherapy is a solution because there is a very clear bias against psychiatry and psychology yes. in this film that is hard to watch. <laughs> It's yeah. So yeah. So this is, that's, that's also another thing of why I find this movie really challenging to, to just, just to watch. This is so deeply personal and it is, it is so specific to his experience that it's almost like taking part in it is like you are, you are looking at something that you can maybe feel like it's none of your fucking business. Yeah. <laughs> Cause this is, this is really him just airing his fucking laundry, kind of getting some shit off of his chest and just letting it out. And it, it it almost feels like he's in this in this moment. I kind of wonder how he feels about this movie these days. But that I desperately want to know that, but I don't think he has much to say about. It. That's why I want to read that book, and I I'm surprised I never have. But yeah, but uh, but uh, God, I forget where I was going with that. Well, it's but. just it's it's hard to watch for me because it's like you're om- you're almost there, man. Like you've got so much of it, and yet you don't have the other part of it. You are resistant to the other part of it, right? Because at the very end, it seems to land on a very resonant point. Yes, but I can't quite tell how he is positioning himself in the narrative. So I don't know if our sort of main character is a person that I'm expected to sympathize with because there's a lot of times to at the time. I think this is a little like a Joe Gillis thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I suppose we, 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 we could just address those unless you've got yet reviews. 
Uh, I do. I really do. Um, because what I think is is so interesting is the way that this movie now is, I think it's pretty highly regarded, uh, maybe not by audiences broadly, but by, I think, critics and by academics. I think it's very um, uh, high. It's notable, if nothing the else. The thing that I kept seeing, the, the, the phrase that I kept seeing in like modern sort of re-examinations of this movie is the forgotten Cronenberg movie or like, you know, this, this, or this notion that this is a title. That's I would argue that rabbit on. is the forgotten Cronenberg movie. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. Um, the, the consensus at the time seemed to be this movie is garbage and has absolutely no position on anything and has nothing to say, which I find very, very surprising because if nothing else, this movie has something to say, and it has got some real fucking hard positions on these things. Yes, it is an extremely fucking meaningful movie, and it's crazy, crazy angry. Like, it is energized yeah. in a way that other horror movies at the time were not. And it's and it's strange that people would be, that like, that reviewers would be this aggressive towards it. I think it. they were just so turned off by it that they were like, fuck this. I don't even know how to review this. Because a lot of them really do say, like, I don't really know what to say about this movie yeah unsurprising so the uh the toronto star and this is a bit of a choppy thing because this is the one that's like he doesn't really know what to make of it and so he's like he doesn't know what to say so it's uh he says uh the headline is disgusting brood is a tasteless film <laughs> uh, and he goes on to say my own reaction was one of mingled disgust and disbelief maybe a movie like the brood shouldn't be reviewed at all its fans just need to know it's arrived and where it's playing and i was like damn <laughs> that is a cold review that's, like that's that's some i don't know that's real that's, a, that's a reviewer just being like look look listen I am not the person to review this movie, so here's what he, I think. Like, he does make a lot of real negative comments. Um, Miami Herald, uh, there's no reason not to wait for The Brood to pop up on the, the TV Late Show where it will be free. Oh, God. Which, all right, don't be dismissive, you fucking douchebag. Uh, the LA Times, uh, The Brood is so totally sickening, it's an irresponsible work itself. You can't but feel that the MPAA, in its lenient rating, hasn't been very responsible either. Which I have a problem with, because there is nothing that objectionable, except for one moment at the end. And even that, it's pretty tame. Yeah. It's gross, but it's tame. Yeah, yeah, it's, this is not a gore fest, nope. so... Mm. But thematically, the best, it's pretty weird, but yes. that's not enough to get you a fucking X rating at the time. And I think that's probably what everyone got hung up on is that it's a very hard content. Like it's ve it's a very confrontational in a way that is uncomfortable, like we just said. I yeah. mean, even Art Hindle, when they ask him in that, the you know, the Fangoria thing, they're like, well, did you have a good time making it? He was like, mm, not really. He's like, it's, you know, the subject matter is pretty upsetting and sad. And everybody was kind of aware of that because it was really kind of playing out at that time. So... Yeah, it was hard. So I think it's just the fact that it is kind of a it's a tough subject, but the best one I saved for last. And it's it's good old Raj. Oh, good. Chicago Sun Times. The Brood is an El Slizo exploitation film camouflaged by the presence of several well-known stars, but guaranteed to nauseate you all the same. To which I say, hey, Roger Ebert, eat a whole bag of dicks, you fucking loser. <laughs> You obviously weren't paying attention or you just absolutely once again refuse to entertain anything that's happening as though yeah. it's legitimate. Like, like it's like you watched 30 minutes of the movie and was like, eh, fuck this shit. Yeah, I know. The, the man who wrote, who wrote Beyond the Valley of the uh -huh. Dolls wants you to think, wants you to know that this movie is sleazy. Yeah. yeah. And I like I I'm not surprised because it is it does get pitched as a horror movie. Um, but it. The more you watch this film and you on rewatches, you get so much each time. It is a surprisingly complicated story that is very smart uh, and very nuanced. And like, it's pretty moving, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I tried to like thematically, the divorce angle is really kind of what makes it so memorable. And I tried to look up what the condition, like what, what like divorce was like back in like 1978 when they made the movie, because it, it, it seems like when, when I was a kid, like, like every, like two thirds of the kids I went to school with were fucking parent. Their parents were divorced and because shit. it's, it starts right then. 
It's that yeah. idea. And Again, it's the, it's the baby boomer thing where like all of a sudden they were like, you know what? Maybe it is okay to get divorced. And of course it is okay to get divorced. There's no reason you should stay together if you fucking hate each other. <laughs> You're not doing anybody any favors, least of all your children. Yeah. Cause I, I, I can't remember when it was, but like Ronald Reagan, like enshrines it as a sort of like, as a, as a right either nationally or when he was in California, but uh, the whole no fault divorce thing, because I guess before mm-hmm. that, getting a divorce was really kind of a pain in the ass, which yes. is why a lot of people you had to st- basically prove that you were entitled to this thing, which I think is absolutely insane. It's crazy. It's crazy, but yeah, definitely some of that, uh, some of that patriarchal shit, where where you know the woman is by by marriage is now the sort of possession of the man, and so like getting out of that contract is a is a fucking monstrous affair. I think you do see a little bit of that attitude in this because this movie. I think David Cronenberg gets labeled a misogynist a lot, which I don't think is a fair assessment of his movies at all. I think he has issues with women sometimes. Yes, because a lot, not all the time, but a lot of the time, the women in his movies are, they're dangerous. Yes. And they're usually a vector for the sort of main character man's undoing. Yes. So where I landed with this, because I thought about it a lot today, is I think what what we're seeing is not so much misogyny as it is a fascination with what could happen if women become fully empowered and then turn that power and sort of rage on men. Mm-hmm. So it, it is misogynistic in its way, but I think it's also, it's a, a larger fear, but also not so much. There's a fascination there as though like, I do sort of want to see it happen though. Like that's to get that idea. I mean, you see it in, in Rabbit, you see it in this, and you see it in video drama. It's like what what happens when powerful women want revenge? Because that is essentially what a lot of men's fears of women is sort of rooted in. It's same same thing with a lot of like racism. It's like, what happens if if we gave them everything we had, would they just turn it on us? Right. And I think that's what comes across as misogyny. And sometimes I think it does just read misogynistic because it is. Um, but I think it's a little bit, it's not quite so cut and dry in this case. And this one is also very specific. Yeah, yeah. Like it is, a, it is misogyny, but it is misogyny directed at one particular person. <laughs> a person that he really, really doesn't like. Mm-hmm. No. So shall we do it? Shall we get you into it? it? All get right. into it. So we open on the eagle in close up with another man. My note literally says the eagle. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to call him the eagle the whole time though. He's softly berating him for his weakness. But then we pull out a little and we see an audience in the darkness beyond the lights of what appears to be a stage. And now a third man enters the audience, Frank, our protagonist, as the intensity of the performance on the stage grows. The eagle appears to be trying to drag some sort of reaction out of the bearded man in front of him. He suddenly pulls off his shirt and reveals that he's covered in sores that were not there a minute ago. Now, he's doing this by baiting him. They're doing role-playing, which, again, this role-playing was a sort of a big thing in the 70s and 80s. Uh, gestalt therapy is, yeah. is what that was, yeah. Um, and uh, there is, I'm, we don't need to get into the, the, the sort of theory of it, but he is uh, pretending to be his father, and he's sort of baiting him by being, um, well, very misogynistic, uh, by calling him Michelle, because character's name is Michael, and so he keeps calling him Michelle. And I was listening to something earlier, as another podcast, where one of them says something about this being an early representation of a trans character, and I thought, you are nah. wildly misreading this moment. Nope. nope. <laughs> because that is I, absolutely I, not what's happening. Because I also did that this time. So I was like, let's let's hear what other people are saying about it. And I, f- I found a podcast that was specifically feminist examinations of, of horror movies, and it was of this, of this one, and uh, I, I, I'll I put it in the show notes or something like that. I can't remember. I think it was called Final Girls. Mm. And their uh, their assessment, I thought, was fucking beautiful. Like, they really, really kind of d- dug deep and sort of helped me kind of, like, form a picture of, like, how I wanted to talk about this. But, no, this is not this is not an early, exa- like, examination of, like, a, a trans character in, the, in horror movies. No, but it, I think this is also an, in- this is our introduction to one of the things that, David Cronenberg believes about uh, sort of the human psyche in general, maybe, yeah. uh, but psychiatry more broadly, uh, is the idea that it's really all about uh, your relationship with your parents. 
Yes, that's the whole Freud thing. And, and I mean, there is a lot of truth to that, but he really digs in in this one. So this the whole point of what they're doing is he's pretending to be this guy's father and he's treating him very, very badly and abusing him the way his father did in order to provoke a response. And he does. It just is a physical response. <laughs> yep. So we're going to learn about we're going to learn about that. That's uh, psychoplasmics, which is uh, so the, great. The, it's cool. They, he, so, uh, Cronenberg loves an institute. Yes, because there's he said, there's several of them. Which honestly, that's a very that's a very '70s sci-fi thing. Yep, uh, and and it was it's uh, it's stuff that it, that appeared in in Ballard as well. It's also very Kingian in its way. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Like especially with Firestarter. Mm-hmm. So the sores grow and get worse as the scene goes on. As the eagle and this bearded man seem to reach some sort of conclusion. I also yep. just assume this is just how Oliver Reed talks to everybody. Just in real life. <laughs> that that very kind of like calm, collected way until he gets wicked drunk. Yeah. And then, it, but always a little condescending. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I, I, when, when I, I looked him up and I didn't, I never knew this about him, but it sort of explains a few things. He apparently was dyslexic. Mm-hmm. And so uh, he had a hard time with scripts, but he could really express the shit out of him when, once he got it. But when they would rewrite a script on the set, like to, you know, address budgetary challenges or whatever, it would, he would have to basically like go through this whole fucking process of whatever it was that he eventually kind of figures it out. And it would, it would frustrate him and piss him off. And the way that he would sort of like bail himself out of that was by being kind of shitty to everybody else about it. So this uh, kind of explains a little bit about about Oliver Reed. I mean, I, I, I'm not very sympathetic. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he's not a man who who deserves deserves uh, too many tears. No. but uh, just uh, I I do I do appreciate him as an actor. Like whenever he shows up, I'm like, oh shit, hey, Oliver Reed's in this. This is gonna be good. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the 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 eagle is now playing a guy named Doctor Raglan. And there's a guy next to Frank in the audience who remarks that he is a genius. And then and everybody... that's the only thing anyone says. And then they yeah. all just get up and file out. Not Frank. Show... Frank, who is the personification of beige. <laughs> yes. So again, yep. If a mop was a person. Brown, brown leather shoes is his, is his motif. Which I, at first I was just like, well, this is just maybe Art Hindle. But then I, like, it, after a while I was like, oh, he's supposed to be this kind of blah character like he's he's just this pragmatic guy with a you know a solid job and he's you know he is the stifled man of the late 70s and 80s yeah yeah he's he's just this guy because right? he will be his his inability to deal with anything in this movie head on is sort of what is the problem yeah, yeah part of the problem yeah. Little little terrorist munchkins is also the problem. <laughs> yep. So before he leaves, Frank goes to a room in the same institute, picks up his waiting daughter, Candy. Uh, so when they're back at home, he gives her a bath and finds scratches and bruises on her back, sending him racing back to the Raglan Institute, uh, whatever it's called. Soma Free, I think is what it's called in it the is movie. The Soma Free Institute of Psychoplasmics. Nice. Uh, which is a very severe looking building in the woods. And that's the thing about that's the thing about early Cronenberg that I also love, and it must just be like a, a characteristic of a lot of architecture in Toronto that there's a ton of brutalism. And well, this dude, I mean, this Cronenberg, the, loves a brutalist building. Yeah, br- I mean the the brutalist movement was 20 years earlier and a little bit after, so it's like there's all of this brutalist architecture around, and I it's fucking ugly as hell. Uh, but yeah, it was very, very popular. So during urban renewal, when that hits, I mean, not so much in Canada, well, a little bit in Canada, but when here, that's why we have so much of it is because they bulldozed everything. And we're like, well, we got to build new stuff. Hey, this brutalism is really uh, utilitarian looking. Why not with that? <laughs> yeah, we got a lot, why of, there's a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> so Frank confronts Raglan about the injuries. And we learn that his wife, Nola, is isolated here at Raglan's Institute undergoing therapy. And Candy was there visiting for the weekend. Now, Raglan won't let Frank see his wife, though, because that the, would... Th- that the, would. the marks on Candy's back look like bite marks. They do. They do. So I, apparently there's a lot of shit that... Because Candy, as a character in this movie, is speaking of a personification of a mop. This girl does not react to anything. And on one hand, I think she's supposed to sort of be selling shell-shocked. Yes. Because she is what are, disturbed what are the things, by what's happening. So apparently, there was a lot more of her yes. in earlier versions of the movie that eventually 
he just cuts out. And so she just becomes this kind of like blank stare for, and the, whole, it, for the whole movie. And it falls somewhere between we're not getting the rest of that story and she's just not a good actor. Like she's a child actor. So, you know, children aren't very good actors to begin with, but she's just like n- nothing. She's got fucking nothing. <laughs> blank slate. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so Reed also during the scene, Reed has this amazing affect throughout also pretty much throughout the rest of the movie. He keeps everything very calm. Yeah, he's a real flat. smug piece of shit is what he is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and it, it's, it's what I find is this is this is Cronenberg being very therapy critical because he also sell, he'll say things like uh, you sound hostile. Yep. <laughs> yeah. There's an uh, a, there's that feeling of this. is I think this is where. Uh, Cronenberg sort of reveals a lot about his opinion of this is this idea that therapists or psychiatrists or psychologists, whoever is doing the psychotherapizing is trying to trick you. Like they're uh, yeah. trying to manipulate you to say something. And, and I think people, a lot of people still believe that it's like, listen, everybody, if you have a therapist that you think is trying to trick you, you need a new therapist or you need to think <laughs> about why you, you think that because that is not what they're trying to do. Ever. Yeah, yeah th- that is still a very common yeah. concern Concern about that. People think that they're being like, the, what they think they, the therapy is, is that they're being like brainwashed or something. Yes. And of course, the reality is what they're actually afraid of and what he's afraid of in this movie is having to confront something they don't want to confront. Yeah. Or some kind of truth or past thing or whatever. But it comes across very much as like, they're trying to manipulate me for the courts. You know, the, you know, she's going to use this against me. Yeah. And there's that idea. And it's like, you have a very strange understanding of how this works. I'm guessing you've never seen one. Yeah. But also there's a, a way later into the movie. There is a scene which lays bare Cronenberg's sort of a, a, a attitude towards like psycho- psychology, psychiatry. And I'll, I'll point it out when we get there, but it's, but that's it's, why a, it's, it's a really, it's, really telling moment that I was like, Jesus Christ, dude. That's why it's so interesting. It's like you recognize the first part of the problem is this shit just keeps repeating if you don't do something about it. But you're real stuck on what to do about it, even though it's right in front of you. You're just misunderstanding it. Yeah. So Frank challenges uh, Raglan, threatening to take the matter to the, to the courts. But Raglan is unmoved and faces him down. So Frank takes the matter to his lawyer, and we find out that Raglan has a system of therapy, like we said, it's called psychoplasmics. The name implies that the system gives physical shape to a person's thoughts, hence the sores on the patient's body as uh, Raglan was like. Right, it is the physical manifestation of your psychological pain or anger or whatever. Yep, yep. And so the sort of central conflict of this movie is going to be a uh, a real extreme version of, of that. Because everybody also, else, this, everybody this else where, just has sores. We learn here that her name is Nola Carveth Kelly. Yes, which is the greatest, most seventies name I've ever heard. Carveth is a real wild name. Mm-hmm. So Frank's lawyer uh, tells him that there's nothing he can do. You gotta, be, you gotta go see him, and you gotta be a real mensch. He says. Yeah, this yeah. lawyer is a bit of a stereotype. Yeah, uh, Raglan is not some 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 Svengali. He's a real doctor. Uh, but uh, and this remark has some real divorced guy energy to it. The lawyer tells him the law believes in motherhood. Yeah, that is a hard line. That is one of the moments where you're like, oh, right. This, this is yeah. part of what we're going to have to contend with. Yeah. So Frank intends to dig dirt up on Raglan so he can legally act against him. But the lawyer tells him that he has to send her back uh, candy. That is back there to visit next weekend where the cops will show and take her away from him for good. So Frank picks Candy up from school. We meet her teacher, Miss Mayer, who has uh, some things that she needs to talk to Frank about. Yeah, we'll call not, her new mommy. Yes, but not now. Also, Candy has a Fonzie lunchbox. Yeah. It's pretty great. Miss Mayer is played by Susan Hogan, who is married to actor Michael Hogan, who appears in our episode about the equally as Canadian, the peanut butter solution. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then uh, Frank then drops Candy off at grandmother's place. Oh. Now, this Boy. is the part where I am not sure if we're supposed to read Frank as sympathetic or not, because Cronenberg has since stated that this movie is his response to Kramer versus Kramer, which he found to be sentimental and schmaltzy. And while he's not necessarily wrong, 
that movie takes steps to show that both parents in that in, in that sort of divorce are kind of equally culpable for the collapse of the marriage and they all kind of eventually sort of take responsibility for it but that's not that's that's a hollywood ending that's not and really I, how this I shit. think on some level he does understand that because there is this is why i said i'm not sure if uh, Frank as a character if, is supposed to be sympathetic because we are supposed to understand him as, you know, an overly pragmatic, very kind of bland man who's just ineffective and might also be part of the problem. But is that, is that his, is that his intention or is that how he's written? Cause there's a distinction there. He's very, he said that this character is very much him. You know, this okay. Nola is his wife. He is Frank. Like, this is a very literal translation of what was going on. Because that's the part that gets me, because Nola is portrayed as this crazy person. Yes, and which is he's something I per- have a problem with. Yes, and he's portrayed as this, like, put-upon husband who's fa- and, and father who's, like, back is against the wall. But he's, uh, but- so, he's so rigid in his approach to everything. Like, he is, there is one way to do everything, and if we just do it that way, and that's why nothing works in this movie, because he's just like, if we just do it this way, everything will be fine. And he seems to recognize on some level that you can't really be that way. You have to be able to be a little more flexible, because Frank's whole problem is that He's late for shit. He's, you know, he's a little bit uh, spacey and sloppy, um, you know, but he's, it's all about how things appear. And if I show them she's crazy and I show them what is happening, then this will happen and everything will be fine. And it's like, you keep seeing that that's not working yet. You cannot do anything to stop it. I don't know if that's intentional. I think a lot of shit is coming through in a way that maybe Cronenberg didn't intend it to. Yeah. But I don't know that he, we're supposed to sympathize because he is supposed to be such a bland, ineffective person. Right. But also, like, he makes all of this noise about, like, my daughter, my daughter, my daughter. I've got to I've got to I've got to protect her. I have to save her from her mother. And the first fucking thing he does with her is he drops her off at this other person's house. Who is very up. clearly drunk, <laughs> way drunk. And we're going to learn some terrible, terrible shit about her later on. But for now, he is he has taken his like priority, like the number one thing that matters in his life, and just ponder off on somebody else while he and goes he does and does that wash multiple it. times too. Yes. He does it every time something comes up that he thinks will benefit him. He takes off and leaves her with someone, some stranger. Sometimes, like yeah. And so I don't know if we're supposed to sympathize, but I I think that also might be a part of the era that it's made in oh yeah that like he is just being a responsible man and this is what men are supposed to do and it's the system that's failing men not men who are failing yeah yeah yeah. i guess yeah context is everything in this in this that's why it's a hard one to still watch if you don't understand what's happening at the time yeah uh so candy at grandmother's house is looking at old black and white photos from a box while they talk what I love about this is that the photos they're looking at that she's sort of like lovingly looking at are the ones where she's younger and has no children. <laughs> yes, Candy's yeah. looking at the ones with her mother in them, but she's sort of like, uh, you know, uh, being sentimental about the ones where there are no children. <laughs> yeah. And she's, and she's dramatic and melancholic as they talk and she drinks oh, like character, a fish character. She has got like a fucking, uh, just a pint glass of scotch. She's fantastic. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. It's like, I, you know, it's, it's a, it's a highball glass, but it's like filled to the rib. <laughs> and in, in, in a very like, uh, it's a campy performance. She's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, but also um, the, there's, yeah, it's like those details that you noticed is, is we're probably very deliberate where she was like, Oh, look at this one. I love this one. And it's like, she's the only person in the photo. Right. But Candy is fascinated by this one picture of her mom as a child in the hospital, but and her mom looks as like, a child it like, looks like her last known photograph. Like it is bleak. <laughs> She looks real depressed. It looks like the sort of hospital where they would like chain uh, unruly patients to like the, the the heater or something like that. It's like where but, you go to die from tuberculosis. Yeah. But the her mother as a little girl in the picture is the actress playing Cindy, which is a, a candy, which is a really interesting detail that I, I like. What I don't. Well, I would wonder about this moment. I couldn't really figure it out. So she says she used to get, she's making reference to like the, the, the things we saw on Michael earlier. You know, she used to get these skin problems. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so she says that's why she's in the hospital. But I don't know if we're supposed to believe her or if she's in the hospital because they abuse her. Oh, so the, 
the the way that uh, the takeaway only because I'd, I'd watched this several times now, but the takeaway that I that I got is uh, I think we're supposed to start with that that thought, but like if you think about it later on, the bumps and the bruises that she talks about are just injuries sustained because her mom would beat her up. Okay, that was sort of what I thought, but then they add that little note, and it's like, oh, but maybe it's also this, and I guess it could be both. Yeah, yeah, but can't, yeah, Candy at like wants to know why she was in the hospital so often, which is so dire. Well, this is when they have. She has this great. I think this might be one of the best lines in the entire movie when uh, her mother says, 30 seconds after you're born, you have a past. And oh, 60 God. seconds after that, you start to lie to yourself about it. Damn. Dark <laughs> as Nana hell. is in her cups and she is sad. <laughs> I love that phrase. In, the, in, in your cups. Yeah, it, cool. it has a real, like, we're going to play a little game called Get Nana a Refill kind of. Oh. Like, this is, this is, she is, she is a sloppy lady and she's being very <laughs> inappropriate. It and it is super yeah. dark. Yeah. So meanwhile, something in the kitchen is punching its way out of the refrigerator. Nope, not the refrigerator. What because, is that then? Because I thought, why is why would this little gremlin be in the refrigerator? Because it's I a little, it's a little cubby. It's not. It's where the milkman leaves it. It's like a you know when you get oh, like, a, shit. like a urine test done and you put it in the thing and they take <laughs> it from the other side. It's like that. It's That's old timey shit. Yeah, because I was like, why is this thing in the refrigerator? Oh, God, How that's... did it get in the refrigerator? Yeah. So grandmother goes to investigate, remarking that she's going to freshen up both their drinks. What I love about this moment is like, not only is this little this little munchkin here to murder them, but he's also just going to fuck up her kitchen first. <laughs> she trashes it. shit off the counter. Yep, yep, yep. Gonna freshen your drink. Freshen your drink, governor. Yeah. <laughs> Fresh from out. the streets of Sussex, they are. <laughs> <laughs> Oh uh, yeah. So that phantom something in the kitchen is positively trashing the place. Yeah. And then a, a small hand grabs a meat tenderizer. So grandmother enters the kitchen and is horrified by what she finds. Now, we don't get a good look at it, but it's a small person in a snowsuit similar to the one we saw Candy wearing at school. And it leaps at her and attacks her with a hammer, beating it to death while shrieking. Yeah, just blood all over that beautiful bamboo wallpaper in the that, kitchen. That fucking house has the most aggressive decorating yeah. ever. That, it's a lot like uh, the house in Black Christmas. <laughs> yes. But like there's weird, like there's fucking wallpaper in places where there shouldn't yeah. be wallpaper. It's such a that strange. very 70s. It's such a strange house. So Candy enters the kitchen and emotionlessly looks over the scene and then the snarling killer reveals itself to her suddenly before vanishing, leaving a pair of bloody child's handprints on the railing leading yeah. upstairs. And a bowl of delicious jelly beans on the table. <laughs> I will say that moment where she looks up and it's just sort of like looking out from behind the banister at her, that's a little bit creepy. Spooky shot. There's a lot of really awesome photography in this movie, like sh scenes that are just shots that are set up in ways that really really work and then we started we cut back to nana who's on the floor she's been tenderized to death and she it's a very much the shot is very much like when uh janet lee falls in psycho for like the oh, when yeah she, like, when she finally dies and sort of lands on the floor it's very much like that static shot of her eye and her face and there's yes. a there's a bunch of shots in this that are feel like they are pulled directly from hitchcock uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, if they were just like riffing and playing with like lighting and shit, just to sort of try shit out. So Frank at a work uh, at work on a job site, which is a house being built somewhere in Toronto, gets and a phone again, call. What a pragmatic murder. job! Like it's he is an he is a restoration architect, which is a very specific job. Yeah. So at the police station, the detective in charge explains how they found the body and how they found Candy. And he tells Frank that she's seeing a psychologist right now because she was a little too cool when they found her. Yeah, and Frank also is a little too cool about his daughter having witnessed or possibly committed a murder. Yeah, yeah, and it's not so, yeah, so also, it's not just me that thinks her affect is really weird. Yeah, at, at various points throughout this entire movie, like, people should be upset about shit, and they never are. Which no, I, uh, there's an autopsy on a fucking monster, and yeah. the, and the and the the morgue technician is just like, this is fucking awesome. Yeah, and they're all just kind of like, huh? How about that? Never <laughs> seen one of those before. Yep. Like, yeah, because it's not a thing. Yeah. So the cop also asks who would want to kill her, and Frank's reply is really weird. What when he <laughs> says, "Juliana had a long series of lovers. I never met any of them." A long series of lovers. And I, so I was like, that is a fantastic line. Also, how progressive. 
<laughs> Good for you, Juliana. Good yeah. for you. Get get it. Just get out there and get it. You know, divorce didn't keep you down. No. Nope. Get so over this- it, Frank. <laughs> so the psychologist comes in with a serious Mike Brady perm. And that, he expl- I, my note says, tell me you're in the 70s without telling me you're in the 70s. <laughs> I, you know what? If it wasn't the 70s, I would ask one question. Is it a wig? Yeah. I don't, I don't think no, it is. No, it's not. No. He explains that she's been seriously traumatized by whatever, by whatever it is that she saw. They can't get ever, anything out of her. And the officers found her in a deep sleep when they went in. And so this, again, is part of that. Because remember, this is around the time where we get Michelle remembers. We start Uh to see satanic panic starts to emerge. There's this belief about repressed memories, uh, about like all the ways that your brain can try to protect you that are wildly misunderstood at the time and then sort of exploited by the right to stoke fear. You see some of that creeping in every now and then here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Also, there's a wanted poster for Ted Bundy in the background. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, and which at the time of this movie's production, like he had just been caught for his for the last time before they finally put him away. Yeah, yeah. The psychologist explains that trauma tends to surface in one way or another, so it's important that she learn to remember what happened so she can process it. He's seen children her age with ulcers, he says. And then they cut back to Candy, who looks like she has been rubbing a chocolate bar all over her face. <laughs> just, just eating eating like, an ice cream sandwich and missing every does time. Does she not know how to eat food? <laughs> Why is it everywhere? Now, I don't have I'll children, say this, when, but I assume they know how a mouth works. When my kids were little, they would eat like that. And I, like, I would look at them and be until they were like eight or nine. I'd be like, did you... Did you not use your hands while you were eating? Like, it's really, it's like that. But like, you know, so. it goes in your mouth, right? <laughs> Reminds me of that. Uh, remember that show Crank Yankers? <laughs> yes. Where there's a Sarah Silverman woman, she calls uh, people and she's like asking about their toilet habits. It's, it's something she's like, she's like, sir, you know you're supposed to take the wrapper off the Twinkie, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's very much like that. Like, why are you eating this way? That is not how anybody eats food. I know, I know. Uh, so, yeah, back at the Soma Free Institute, Raglan does another session with Nola, uh, this time about her father. So here's my issue with Nola in general. Samantha Eggers, great actor. I mean, obviously, she's in a I, I, I think Actually, I think I forgot to mention that the you lead did. up. You skipped over the, the part where she's talking about. Yeah, because the lead up to. Fucked up mummies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> the lead up to the murder of her mother is there we get our first session between Raglan and Nola. This is the first time we see Samantha Agar. And the and the and the, the back and forth is I think he starts out uh his role is um I think he starts out as Candy. As Candy and, and then, then he s- switches to her father. To her mother. Because he's gonna do her father right. later. But uh and, and it's this whole thing where it's like uh, uh I would never I would never hurt her moms don't don't hurt their kids and then he switches over to her mother and she's like oh you hurt me all the fucking time you beat right. me up you threw me down the stairs you twist my words so like there's this whole like really like her mother is a fucking monster but you never really know I mean, obviously she is, and she has tons of like regret and guilt and shame and all this other shit, but like, you never know if you can really fully believe Nola because it's, she's so other in every possible way. But my problem with her, Samantha Egger, fine actor, and she does great in this, like she, her face work in this film is outstanding and captivating in every possible uh, way. And the way but, that they shot her is amazing. Like she is lit with this like halo yes, around she her. She is almost like a queen. Yeah. The way she's always shot, the way she's sitting, she has this kind of like diaphanous robe on. It's yep, very... She's got a couple of, yeah. And, and you never see her standing. She never walks. She's always just like on this bed. But her Re- presence is so commanding that you is... cannot look away from her. That's why I said that. Like it is, it feels like she is all up and down this movie, but she's really not. She's in a couple of key scenes. She's also ridiculous as hell. <laughs> yeah. And here's my problem with that. It's fine to have a character like this, but the thing is, if Frank, because Nola reads as batshit crazy from beginning to end, like you don't get this feeling that she's decompensating in any way or that like something is spiraling out of control. 
and she's getting wilder and weirder. You get the feeling that she has always been this way, which is yeah. at a fucking 11 all the time. <laughs> and, and so my issue is that if, you know, uh, Frank as a character, you know, again, stable guy, really handsome dude, like seems real normal. Why would he have an interest in this woman who is so clearly off the fucking rails all the time? And I think there is something to be said for that. Like he's a little bit drawn to her crazy. Yeah. But she's so weird. She's so strange and foreign and bizarre and intense all the time that it's like you can't sit and have a conversation with a person like that because they're out of their mind. She never gives you the impression that she's present in the moment. She's elsewhere. Like there is a moment later on kind of at the end where she does seem a little bit normal. But for the entire movie, she's so wild and like unhinged that it's like. If you're always like this, you just read like a psychopath, like you were a rambling, crazy person who's really intense about absolutely everything. So I find it really hard to believe that these two ever would have had a relationship, much less one that was, uh, you know, escalated to marriage and children before spiraling out of control because she just is so insane in like uh, in like yeah. a kind of like, again, it's that King Lear madness where it's like you are just real crazy in a way yeah. that it is like your whole body is crazy. <laughs> it's you know what it is, is I think honestly what it is, is I, I think a more skillful writer might have drawn this out and escalated and sort of made it a more organic sort of experience where she becomes crazier as the movie goes on. But as he ma is it just a sort of matter of sort of pragmatism and movie making? Like they just were like, boom, she's nuts. Shoot the movie. But also like we, because he's so he's the one writing it. He's like this fucking bitch. Yeah, she's real crazy all the time. Don't you understand? I'm trying <laughs> to tell you she's really crazy. So right. Because like, okay, maybe he's, if you weren't so invested in in telling us how crazy she is, that this is, character might have more nuance to it. That's because, all. That's all. That's gotta be it. That's gotta be all. She is of like it. fucking Grimm's fairy tales monster. <laughs> like she is just out of control in every way, and right. I like it. And it's campy, but at the same time, it's like. I don't believe that you have had a relationship with anybody because you're so intense. <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, that's gotta be it. Cause like, I'm sure that when he was right at the stage of his, of his relationship with this woman, as he was writing this, he, there was no memory of the good times. It was just all the shit that she's put right. through, you know? And she's just so alien and weird and strange. And you just never, and you can't have sympathy for her because it's like, I don't, I barely recognize you as a person much less like a grieving mother. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to do that again. She's going to have another uh, session with uh, Raglan, the eagle. And it and really, like, her sessions always have a kind of like, she's my daughter and my sister energy to them. Like, <laughs> it's just like real, like, like I said, she's at an 11 immediately. Yeah, this time it's about her father. And all seems to be going smoothly until he triggers a reaction to the idea that Frank is just trying to protect Candy the same way that her father tried to protect her. But what she reveals is that he didn't. He walked away and just let it all happen. So at home, Frank is taking photos of Candy's injuries. And then the two of them go to the airport to pick up Nola's father. And then he once again leaves Candy with someone other than himself. Who is also an alcoholic. Who is drunk and sloppy. even drinking in the car. Even sloppier drunk than the, than uh, his ex-wife. And way less fun about it, if I'm being honest. <laughs> he's a, yeah, he's a sad, sad crybaby drunk. Yeah, there's, there's no uh, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf here. <laughs> so Frank goes to a home of some sort. To, I think it's like a hospice or something. It's like, like a that. halfway house kind of thing. Like it's a, it, uh, a, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for here. It's like an organization for people coming out of recovery or going into recovery of some kind. Okay, yeah. And so he, uh, like an Frank assisted goes, living type of thing. That's that's what it is. It's it's like uh, yeah, they they have medical staff or like nurses and shit. It's where we meet the weirdest character in the entire movie who I find so compelling. He is the he's a very interesting character. I like this character a lot. He uh, I think his name is Jan or Jan Hartog. Jan Hartog. Yeah. And he is and, a, he's, and this guy is in a bunch of David Cronenberg movies. I've never seen him in anything else, but he's in like from Shivers to the shit in the 90s. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, he's previously a patient of Raglan who has gone through the whole psychoplas. And when we meet him, he is rolling around on the floor. <laughs> he's a very flamboyant dude who is rolling around on the floor 
in order to circulate his lymphatic fluids. Because you see, your your heart it, it pumps your blood and, and you know moves your body fluids, but nothing nothing moves your lymphatic fluids. And so he does he does that to circulate his lymphatic fluids. I- Bottom line. Also a crazy person. Yeah, but I got to wonder, like, did Cronenberg give him any direction? Or he, he was like, you know what? No, I got this. I know I'm how I'm going to do this. I'm going to bring my own tracksuit from home. Because this dude has got a hard comb over, like real hard comb Real over. hard. Um, yeah, and, and so both of these guys are preparing cases against Raglan. And we're going we're gonna to learn why Jan Hartog is, is doing it in just a moment. But what I think is so fascinating about Jan Hartog as a character is that everybody in this movie has a feeling that, or they they sort of have a sense that if I can stop one thing, or if I can, you know, if I can stop Raglan, if I can shut down the Institute, that will solve my problem. If I can make Nola go away, that will solve my problem. Jan Hartog is resigned, resigned to his fate. Yes. Dude with nothing to lose. And we are led to believe that that he is very, very crazy, which, you know, perhaps he is. He seems unwell. But for all of his being unhinged, he's the only one who really seems to understand the way things actually are. Because his whole plan is to sue uh, Raglan and the Institute, not because he thinks it's going to solve any problem, just to fuck with him. It's revenge. The whole thing is revenge. He says it right up front. He knows he's going to lose this case against him, but it will hopefully result in bad publicity for the Institute. The reason is because he has uh, lymphosarcoma. So it's like a lymph cancer, the lymph nodes. And he's wearing this like uh, cowl around his neck. It's a towel he has wrapped around his neck. Around his neck that he pulls down and just reveals very quickly a very David Cronenberg like spe- like appliance that's it's really also, the, gross to look at. The appliance doesn't look very good either. I think that makes it even harder. It's like it's disgusting, but also shoddy looking. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's. It's uh, it's gross. It's but I think he's looking. so interesting because he's the one who's just like, no, that's not good. That's not why I'm doing it. I'm not going to I'm not going to save anybody. I'm not going to get any money out of this. Like, I just I just want revenge. Yeah. I and love he's it. the only one in the movie who seems to understand. No, the system's working against you. You can't do it that way. Yeah. Yep. So Nola's father ambushes Raglan at Soma Free and is shocked to find out that he knows about her mother's death, but hasn't told her. The shock. She's, would be, she's at a very critical stage in her therapy. Yes, yes. The it shock. Seems would, like un- she's had a critical stage of her therapy a lot. <laughs> I know, uh, which is some bullshit. Uh, he's engaging in therapy with this woman. Processing grief is a big part of the deal. Anyway, uh, late to pick up candy from school. Frank finds her playing alone with her teacher, Miss Mayor. Yep, they invite her over for dinner. New mommy. Candy's an okay wingman. <laughs> yep. So they uh, they talk over dinner, and he tells her that uh, he feels like on his good days, he feels like he got taken in. She she married him for his sanity, but it went the other way. Yeah, and here's that, again, that sort of like vague men's rights bullshit where it's like, uh, she lied to me about who she really was. And it's like, oh, yes. fuck you, you asshole. That's, that's Why don't you the, open your but, eyes and actually talk to someone? That's the thing. That's the part of this movie that keeps haunting me is I'm like, I am I... Uh, it's does one Cronenberg man's expect, visceral anger. Yeah, I was like, does Cronenberg expect me to sort of take his side on this? I think I I don't know that he does. I think it's just an expression of anger and frustration. And I think if you could if you look at it that way, it makes it easier to understand that he's so he really is. He's sort of like a very frustrated person who's trying to do what he's supposed to do, and it's not working. Unfortunately, he's taking a very easy, th- and this is where the frustration part comes in, he's taking that very easy out of, but it's their fault. She's yeah. the one who tricked me. She's the bad one. Rather than being like, all right, well, how can I solve this fucking problem? He's so intent on it being someone else's fault all the time. And that's yeah. why it becomes so hard to take. It's like, you know, she chose the wrong guy. It's that same argument of like, she should be with me, but she, you know, I'm, I'm, she thinks I'm a loser. It's like, well, cause you are a fucking loser. That's why. Yeah. Like it yeah. has that men's rights vibe of like, you know, the, the system's protecting her cause she's a woman. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, I am not, I am not divorced. I, uh, but I have seen one up very up close and like parts of the parts of this feel very authentic, you know, because they are. But like they, I've seen this behavior before, 
but it it's always it it comes from both parties like both of them are hurting and oh, reeling and I know what you're talking about <laughs> yeah uh, but it, but why but, am I not surprised either you know but um in this case we only get like the one side you know like it it's that's that's the part that really kind of bugs me is, is or it, it doesn't bug it doesn't bug me it just it like i said it kind of haunts me through this because usually uh, as i watch a movie i'm looking for a character to sort of hang on to and he is and supposed to be that character unfortunately yeah and i'm just not finding it in this movie it doesn't take away from the experience i still enjoy this movie tremendously it's just it makes it hard for me to sort of like t- really really take really invest in it and take the ride and again that's this is where that knowing the context is so important because if you don't know where this movie comes from then yeah, it just looks like some fucking misogynistic men's rights rant. And yeah. because it kind of is, but when you realize, oh, it's because it's written by a man who is living this as he's making it, and he is so angry about it that it is bleeding through. Yeah. I don't think if he made this now, it would read that way. Not just because of the passage of time, you know, perspective has changed, but because he probably doesn't feel that same frustrated anger anymore. Yeah. Because yeah, that's like what the this, frustration this, does, is it makes you sort of lash out because you don't know what else to do or say, and you start to feel like a victim. Yeah, yeah, it's it's desperation. It's it's a need to express And when I look something. at him that way, I can sort of, I don't like it. I still think it feels kind of yuck to, to I, watch but, it, but I but understand, I understand why. It. Yeah, yeah. But uh, hey, um, Nola's father, a coward, calls. He's well, drunk. Yeah, he hops back in the car, takes a drink, starts <laughs> up the machine, and yep. he goes on his way. He's yep. got a he's, plan. <laughs> he's drunk at grandmother's house and is overcome with emotion. Yeah. He, he wants Frank to go up to Soma Free with him to break Nola out. So now Frank. So Frank says, leave. hey, I got a stranger here I can just leave my child with. I'll meet you there in 20 minutes. Yeah, I, I'll give him I'll give him a little something here. She's she's Candy's teacher. So she's not like a complete stranger. And there is also the vibe of like, I have to go there because if I don't, something bad might happen. Yeah. So he's got to go up there and defuse the situation. So meanwhile, Barton, the grandfather, has a sloppy drunk episode all over the crime scene at the house, collapses on the bed. Really? It's it's rough. It's rough to watch. Yeah. And not realizing it, the snarling murderer from before crawls out from under the bed and attacks him, beating him to death with two glass globes. That scene is rough. It's hard. All of the, there's, except for, except for Miss Mayers, the, the sort of savaging, the bludgeoning death scenes in this little intense. Yeah. Yeah. I also but, like uh, that he goes and he lays down because they still have the chalk outline of the body. Yes. By the kitchen. He sort of goes and lays down with it. My favorite thing about that is that it has, usually it's like however the body lays. I don't even know if they ever actually did that or if they still do, but it has the both arms and one of them is like positioned on top of the body. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's, it's very artfully done. It, it looks like a Keith Haring drawing. Yes. <laughs> so, um, Oh, what I love about this moment, though, this is a very cool thing. So he right before when the when the creature kind of comes out from under the bed or wherever it is, he turns very quickly and it and immediately says Nola. Yeah. And my first thought was, sir, is your daughter a four foot tall withered hawk person? <laughs> but then I realized, is he seeing something in this thing that res- like he recognizes as his daughter? Because that's what she is. Like this is a her a manifestation of her rage. Yes. So that's the thing that I like. Because now that we're gonna we're gonna see it for the first time, and it looks like Candy, but also like the child version of Nola that we saw in the photos. Right. And so, so I, yeah, my first thought was a hawk person, but then yep. my second thought was actually that's kind of cool that just sort of out of the corner of his eye, it resembles his daughter. Yeah. Or something of his daughter. Yeah. So Frank arrives and he finds Barton dead, but he also finds the killer. And And poor poor Frank cannot get a minute to himself without finding a dead body. (laughs) I know. This is his worst week. Uh, The thing attacks him and it throws one of the globes at him that just goes straight through the fucking wall. I think that's another great moment because until now, it's like a lot of this is a little bit campy and some of it has to do with budget. But like uh, it's just it just is campy, even though I think these characters, these little monsters are really cool. Yes. It, they have a little bit of like a don't look now vibe to it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The red uh, coats. 
But when it whips the fucking globe at him and it just goes through the wall, it's like, oh shit. It leaves like a perfect hole. Like, you realize like these things are actually very, very strong. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, but the the attack, this attack doesn't last long because it collapses to the floor. It sort of dies before his very eyes. And this is also where we get a lot of the, you know, uh, uh, Howard Shore's score for it feels very psycho. Yep, yep. So at the police station, the detective explains that the killer escaped their notice because they were looking into an Estonian musician mm -hmm. and not a little mutant person. Yeah. We've been spending our time investigating an Estonian musician, but that's after he says that thing was in the house. <laughs> that's right. Uh, I, that's, I want to know more about this Estonian musician. Yeah. That's I, the only my thing. note literally says what with six <laughs> exclamation points. <laughs> yeah. So at home, Miss Mayer answers the phone. And it's, oh, no, and it's, it's the worst no, thing you could have done, lady. Oh, I know, lady. Just don't answer the phone. It's Nola who is infuriating, uh, infuriated that she's there, setting us up for Miss Mayor's ultimate fate. Now, on the way home, Frank remembers the medical examiner's autopsy, told in flashback with this weird purple overlay. So my theory for the black light is that something about so the guy uh so rick baker does a lot of the makeup and the the effects for this and the guy other the guy from um the company with uh what's his face it's three letters K and B. yeah i think one of them is he's from that but it there was a, another guy who did a lot of the prosthetic stuff and yeah. he was like old hollywood guy oh and i think he might have left halfway through the production because like he a lot of the ways that he did things were very like with like modeling clay and shit and like the rest of the guys were like you know we have like plastics and stuff like you don't have to do it and i think the because it didn't look very good they throw this filter on it to, sort of do it obscure, to obscure the it. fact yeah. that it's a little bit like because he said under the lights like a lot of the makeup was melting off yeah yeah it looked it does like what you can see looks pretty crappy yeah and so, yeah. I, that's just my theory is like they put that on there probably just to cover over the fact that it's, you know, not not so great. Yeah. Uh, the medical examiner is uh, really into this thing, though. He's very, very excited to do yeah. that, to do the exam. On. Yeah. He's like, yeah. oh, there's a distinct feature other than the lack of sexual organs. Oh, other than. <laughs> AC announces that uh, because of the way that its eyes are, it can only see in black and white, which is a very uh, interesting Detail. It has no sex organs. It has no teeth. And it has a sack on its back. That oh, it has it. a beak, though. And it has a beak. Yes. Uh, and, and no, yeah, no teeth. It has just gums like a beak. It yeah. says there's a sack on its back that is giving it nutrients and energy, but it's empty now, implying that once it's empty, it starves to death. Yeah, it's like a camel's hump. It's out of yeah. gas. Yep. So most interesting, however, is the lack of a navel. Meaning it wasn't That's spawned. the most interesting part. <laughs> I know. Wasn't well in in a way, yes, because this means I guess, that it, it implies this, this, that it is not of this earth. This human-looking thing is not a human. You know, it's it, it was not birthed by human beings. So and there, that, I, there is something in this moment that feels a little exploitation-y. The way it's it, it feels like that alien autopsy stuff. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. there's actually. There's a scene coming up where, like, the eagle is reading the paper and the yes. body is just on the front yeah. page above the fold. And again, uh, nobody seems, like, uh, alarmed or impressed. They're all just like, huh, well, would you look at this shit right here? It I doesn't know. have here's a navel. A, here's a thing that we have never seen before that is medically impossible. There is nothing like this in the history of human discovery. Uh, I find it pretty remarkable, I guess. Yeah, well, you know, take some pictures, put them on the front of the newspaper, see what the other people think. Yeah. So uh, at Soma Free, Raglan has another session with Nola, this time taking on the role of Miss Mayor. And Nola oh, well, because Frank eventually goes home and, uh, you know, Mayor, Miss Mayor is still there. Yeah, she's like, she, listen. She says, she says, your life is just a little too complicated for me right now. What I didn't get at any point throughout this movie is like you, there is a, uh, an implied romantic interest I guess 
They're supposed but it's not to be so a- heavily implied that like when she says this, I was like, wait, was this an option? Like, was this romance an option? This it didn't yeah, seem like it. it. There's supposed to be like a flirtatiousness between them, but there's only these two very strained encounters between before where like, he between, leaves both times abruptly. Yeah. Like, and then leaves the, his daughter with this woman. So like, yeah, it's just kind of like a failure of storytelling. And I don't like know, the, maybe there was more that just doesn't make it to the screen, but I was like, when it, it kind of falls apart, I was like, like, was this a date? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, look, baby, I got to go deal with my drunk father-in-law. Uh, I'll be right back. 45 minutes He's being here. murdered by a hawk person. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, uh, Frank gets home. He explains to Candy that the creature that attacked grandmother is dead and that she's safe. So at Soma Free, Raglan sees the front page article, which uh, depicts the dead broodling like the alien autopsy. He and he thinks... Uh oh, that's not good. <laughs> yep. Or is it? Yeah. He orders his assistant to have all of the patients except for Mo- Lo- Nola moved out of the institute. His assistant is a very interesting character that you don't ever get much on. He's such an automaton. Yeah. But he's yeah. very he's he's an interesting character. Right. So Frank is called back to the uh, uh, the halfway house where he met Jan. <laughs> where Jan, Jan Hartog is just chilling in his bathrobe. <laughs> yep. The man with the cancer that he's blaming on Raglan. Michael, the man from the very beginning of the movie, is now there, having nowhere else to go since being vacated from Soma Free. And so this is how this is this is this character is sort of a device that Cronenberg is using to kind of move things along. Yeah. So this is how he comes to find out that Nola is now the only one left. <laughs> he's an the informant. Institute. Yeah, and so they have a really tense exchange that I think really fully illustrates Cronenberg's suspicion of therapy. Because but this is also where my favorite line in the entire movie is, is when uh, Jan Hartog leans, because they're, they're talking about like you know getting a class action suit together or something. He leans in and he goes, he's pretty far gone. He'll be dynamite in court. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he, he says it in this way that's like, ha <laughs> He's like that Scott Thompson character from Kids of the Hall. Uh, Which one? <laughs> Uh, the uh, guy, the guy with the martini glass is always just making oh, these little. Oh, buddy Cole. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. that's nice. You should write that down. <laughs> yeah. So Mike's entire problem is laid out here. He's abandoned by his real father and Raglan with this with his therapy s- system, which is a stand-in for his father, but he's also not improving. Right. Uh, he, and he's honestly, just, you seem better off without either of these men in your life, sir. Yeah, he's just addicted to the role play of Raglan. Now, Raglan, meanwhile, goes out to the house where Nola is isolated, but he finds the place locked as he left it. But one of the upper windows is broken. Good thing he's got a gun. Because he says something like, the Michael says something like, the deranged children in the tool shed. That's and, a little later. That's a little later on. Yeah. Oh, but yes. When, yeah, when but, he says that, I was like, you never want to hear a phrase like the deranged <laughs> children in the tool shed. Yeah. So at school, Candy is approached in class by a pair of broodlings in snowsuits. And again, Candy, totally unmoved by these little hawk people. They're horrifying looking. And she's yeah. just like, oh, okay. Yeah, I guess I'll go with you. It is a they, very smart thing because they are also like so they're essentially dressed like candy um and that is intentional but like they're all wearing these big puffy snowsuits because it's canada in the winter and you don't really notice because their backs i mean you can tell that it's them but like all of the children have on the big puffy snowsuits yeah yeah also this uh, i mean i know that i know that it's just because this is when the money came in but like shooting this movie in a Canada winter is very interesting because it's gray as hell. Yeah. It's like fucking winter up here. It's very uh, desolate. The whole movie feels very, especially the, the scene coming up where they walk away. It adds a, it adds so much to it, even though it just happens to be like the time of year that they made the movie. I mean, but, there's a reason why when we did our uh, Christmas movies thing, I put this in there because this movie is so winter. Like it is cold and desolate. That's and right. I forgot about that. Yeah. So, yeah, they stow her away in a side room and then they return to the main classroom where they beat Miss Mayer to death with Which toy. Which is an interesting contrast to what happens later. Right now, they're trying to shield her from violence. Yes. So they uh, they they beat her with toy hammers in front of all of the kids. Terribly embarrassing. One of the kids runs outside, finds Frank talking to another one of the mothers. He takes uh, he takes him back inside to help. But it's too late. Miss Mayer is dead and all the kids are traumatized. And so the kids, during the teacher murder scene, unsurprisingly, fucked up just by being there. This is such a weird scene. The, what I like about the scene, though, 
is uh, the way. So obviously her being beaten with the little children's toys is fucking dumb. But there's a dead silence right before they attack. That's right. That is very chilling and really cool. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that when they, they pick up the little toy hammers, I'm like, that thing weighs like like a, a quarter of a pound. There's That's also, not going to hurt anybody. I mean, the obvious thing about this movie is you could kick the shit out of a 10 year old if you have to. <laughs> Even if there's three of them, you can still probably fight off like, you know, three eight year olds. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's like being attacked by a really small dog, which I imagine is probably why they put that scene in where it throws the globe through the wall, because otherwise people would be like, well, why don't you just fucking kick it across the room or something, just, you know? Just, just punch him in the face. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Candy is now nowhere to be found. So Raglan, again, visits with Nola, who tells him about a dream she just had, that Candy and Frank are coming to see her. I don't and like this. Also, this is... that, that Miss Mayer is, she doesn't feel threatened by her anymore. <laughs> nope. <laughs> the treatment must be working. Yeah. And this is uh, the point where Raglan is like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, fr- uh, fr- Frank rushes into the small apartment that Nola and Candy were living in after they separated. Which is bleak wo- as hell. It, it is, but also this is the point that I wanted to point out that I mentioned earlier. The walls are covered in a combination of religious icons and photos of psychologists implying a, a link between the way that people in therapy sort of yeah. view the, the the founders of psychology as kind of like religious figures. Also, Raglan is among them on the wall. This is like, this is very much Cronenberg speaking to the audience. And there is something to be said for that because not psychology or in general or psychiatry, but these new age approaches and alternative approaches to mental health treatment were kind of built around a lot of like cult of personality shit. So, there was a lot of weird hero worship, whereas like actual mental health treatment was not about that at all. And obviously it's not about the, the practitioner in any way whatsoever, but these other movements are because they're not real treatments. They're just cultural movements, popular cultural movements. Yeah. Yeah. So there is that kind of weird, not a uh, kind of deity worship, but there is this idea that like, Oh, this person is really, really the one, you know, this is Jim Jones. It's, yeah. I'll save you. I have the solutions. Yeah, there is also there. Uh, there is a sort of there is a sort of cult of therapy, a kind of cult of healing today mm-hmm. that you see uh, on, online, which is not really anything to go by. But like, there's a lot of people who like just make so much fucking hay about like healing and trauma and getting over it. But nobody's really getting nobody's really getting better. Nobody's really actually actually doing the work or healing. It's just kind of a part of their their like Internet personality. So, right. Because I, I suppose there's something there because no offense, everybody. But buying crystals and lighting candles isn't going to solve the fucking problem. You still have to talk <laughs> about shit. <laughs> yeah. Mike finds Frank at home. This is the crazy guy with the beard yeah. from before. And he explains to dynamite him that, in court. Yeah, he thinks that Raglan forced them all out for reasons having to do with a group of disturbed kids <laughs> at Soma Free. Yeah, you hate to hear it. The ones that Nola is taking care of. So he rushes to the Institute in the middle of the night to get to the bottom of it all. He ambushes Raglan as he's coming out of Nola's room, reveals to him that the broodlings killed Mrs. Mayor, uh, Miss Mayor, took Candy away, and Raglan informs him that if they're here with her, then they're in the attic, which is right above them. What I think is really interesting about this part is that throughout this entire movie, Frank assumes that Raglan is the one doing this. Like he, this, he is the one to blame. If we can get her out of that thing or, you know, sever their connection, this will all go a lot smoother or it'll all go away. This is when you learn Raglan is not really in charge anymore. And he no, never really was. This is the moment where it does. There's a moment and it's when he goes out and he sees the broken window at the, in the attic when he, I think he, it sort of dawns on him that like, Oh shit, this is completely out of my control now. Right. Because until this point, the whole, the reason he's doing all this is because he thinks she is the key to proving that he has figured this whole thing out. And because in a way, I guess she kind of is, but he realizes at a certain point, this has gone way too far. But the, the thing about it is it's, only after the father dies that he realized, oh, she's the one doing this. But he still knows that she's causing people's deaths. It's only when it starts to like spiral out of control, where it's not just the people she thinks are responsible for what happened to her. It's anyone who makes her angry. 
Yes. Yeah. So it's also, she becomes dangerous to the whole world, not just to a small group of people. Fuck them. <laughs> I know. I, you know, a thing that I also think is kind of interesting about this is that the, that, that the movie actually takes script pages to explain to us how the broodlings work physically. There's not a word spent on how this psychoplasmics business is supposed to work. Yeah, I mean, it's there's a very similar, like, rabbit is the same way. Like, they're just like, oh, it's uh, cells from skin grafts. You know, that's how it works. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Shut up. Don't ask questions. Keep going. Yep. Uh, so anyways, before they can go up and get candy, Raglan tells him the truth about the broodlings. They're linked uh, psychically to her emotions. She birthed them, and they carry out her anger into the real world. So when Candy visited last weekend, Nola got mad at her, and they beat her up a bit, which explains these scratches and bruises. When Nola gets mad at someone, her mother, father, Miss Mayer, they seek them out and they kill them and they'll kill Frank if he goes up there to get candy. So they have to make a plan. So Frank has to go in and talk to Nola. He has to be calm and apologetic. If Nola is chilled out, then the brood won't attack. While he does this, Raglan will go up to the attic and take candy out. And so Frank just does just that. They talk a while. He goes in, talks to Nola. She's wearing this like uh, now it's like a white gown. Yeah, it's the, real cool. Se- it's pretty. It's really cool. Uh, but the, this talk does not go the way that he thought it would. He plays just like he was told. But Nola isn't stupid. She reveals to him that something strange has been happening to her since taking on psychoplasmics. She says, "I'm on a I'm on a strange adventure." And, it's, and ra- she does it really. Like she's plays the role really well. But God, it's just so weird. It is, yeah. And so Raglan now enters the attic and he finds the place outfitted with bunk beds that I guess Nola built at some point. I love the way this looks, though, because it looks like a uh, where do birds go? Is it a roost? A roost chickens go. Yeah, Uh, it looks like that. The way that it's sort of built out in that way. And they're all just kind of perched. Some of them are sleeping, but like most of them are just kind of like perched on the bed. Yeah. Just looking at it, it's creepy as shit. It is, yeah. Because also, it helps that the makeup, which is, uh, I would say, fifty percent crappy, yeah, fifty percent awesome, yeah. You know? Because the idea is really, really creepy. The execution, you now in in what is this? Is it in two K? Is this Criterion or is it four K? This is two K. Yeah. So I mean, either way, it's it, when you're up close like that, it's like you see the the seams and shit. But like the overall aesthetic is really unnerving. Yeah, yeah. So, um, duh, 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 yeah, uh, he finds he he, yeah, he he finds uh candy up there, but like we said, he also finds the place full of broodlings just hanging out. And so back downstairs, Nola pulls back the cape that she's been wearing to reveal the transformation that her body has taken, and she has several embryos growing off of her. It is disgusting. Super gross. Now I feel like. He got to the end of this movie and was like, oh, shit, I'm David Cronenberg, though. <laughs> yeah. Like, it has yeah. that feeling of just like, I got to put something in here. But this is this is like I said, like that flashpoint. This is the moment when he's like, OK, let's let's do something really fucked up. And it is. It's fucking gross there. It's and they're hard to describe. They're like these like some of them are very small, implying that they're new broodlings that are just they just grow off of her. Yeah, it's like parthenogenesis. Her yeah. Uh, but there's one in her lap that is like fully grown. And there, so what they did was they filled condoms with uh, just like gloopy shit. Yeah. And so they're various, like they're just condoms that are sort of like uh, uh, glued to her body and just hanging off like full of gross looking shit. Yep. So she takes the big one and she lifts it to her mouth and she bites it open. <sighs> and it's just like this like ooze of just like slimy blood like comes out of it. She pulls this kind of like the call off of it and removes this like fucking fetus that is just covered in blood and she begins to clean it with her tongue which and that's apparently Eggers idea. was <laughs> her idea. I would love to know how they pitched this movie to her cuz it must it must have gone well. She she loved it. She said she read the script and really loved it. She thought it was really interesting because she was one of those people who want she's, you know, she was sort of a classy actor and she wanted to be in all these different types of movies. And she was like, well, I've never done a horror movie. And this is a really smart, very sort of cerebral movie. And I think she just kind of got into it. Like, you know, that's if, you, cool. if you're in the right mood and you approach it in the right way, it should be a lot of fun. Now, this one, maybe not so much because it's fucking sad as hell, but 
I think she was just sort of like, oh, I, this could be fun. I'll do this. I have yeah. an idea. Why don't I start cleaning it like an animal? Because she said she grew up on a farm. And so she was sort of familiar with like what happens when a, and a mammal gives birth to another thing. If it's not a human, it cleans it itself. Yeah. Oh, God, it's so fucking nasty. I love yeah. it. Though so Frank is suitably horrified and his demeanor changes, which I, angers. I actually don't think he is suitably horrified. I think this is the most reaction we get out of him throughout the whole movie. But this moment warrants a holy shit, if ever one did. <laughs> I and know. he just sort of has this like sh- sort of slightly shocked look on his face. But that's about it. It's probably, you know what it is? It's probably because when they shot the reactions, he was not really looking at her. Right. You know, because the, the scenes of her with the, the new broodling and sort of birthing it, it's just her in the frame. You know? I think most of the time she spent on the set were with Oliver Reed, and that was it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this angers her, which sets off the brood. They attack Raglan. While so Candy... this, it's, this is another Hitchcock moment the, where Raglan is walking out. It's, oh, it's very yes. much like the end of the, birds, the birds when they're walking out. Yeah, they uh, they attack him while Candy runs away and locks herself in a nearby room. Raglan manages to shoot a couple of them, and there's some awesome squib work, like slow mo squibs. Yeah. And well, now this it. this Raglan sort of taking one for the team seems a little out of character. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because he's he's very self centered and arrogant, and there's no there's no indication on the road to this scene right. that he's going to have a sort of change of heart. Like there's no regret here. It's just sort of like, well, got to do something, or she's going to kill us all. Yeah. So yeah, they kill they kill Raglan right in front of her. So once Does she Raglan, react? No. Nope. Not, not a fucking word. Once Raglan is dead, they turn on Candy because Nola's attitude toward her changes. She says, "I'd rather this kill another- her." Another one that I think is really interesting, and this part feels very, very specific and very real. Like a line that maybe somebody said to him. At because this point. is a line that people have said before and gone through with it. Yeah, I'd rather kill her than let you take her. And so left with no choice to save his daughter, and knowing what a statement like that means, he strangles Nola. Cronenberg has said that shooting this scene was extremely satisfying, which, I get it, man, divorce is hard, but come on. <laughs> You don't have to be like an asshole about it. Yeah. Yeah. So with Nola dead, the broodlings also drop dead. Frank takes his seriously traumatized daughter to the car to leave. He tells her it's all over as they drive away. I mean, hey, look, man, you can go home. First of all, that girl is never going to be okay. Also, (laughs) you just killed your wife and there's a shack full of dead owl children back there. Like someone's going to have some questions. There's going to be some questions for sure. Uh, she's petrified. We zoom to her arm, which bears boils similar to the ones that we saw on Mike at the beginning. Uh, the takeaway from this seems to be a rather sobering message that it's the kids in the middle who end up bearing the scars of their parents' trauma. Right. So, again, there's that uh, that understanding that abuse is cyclical and it will just keep going if you do not stop it. But yeah. at no point, like, I don't think he's suggesting how to stop it is by killing someone else. Like, <laughs> no, no, no. That's just the, that's just the crescendo of a horror movie, you know? Uh, so, uh, yeah. Fade to black roll credits, the brood. Hey, so there's, there is the question where, how does this film hold up? Oh, uh, I think, I think it's a, uh, yeah, it's a hard one. It's a hard movie to watch. With like you said, without without the sort of context, and it is a, a lot of context. It's not just understanding. It. You have to understand the era. You have to understand the filmmaker who's making it at the time. Like it's it's a lot to know. It's a movie that is firmly cemented in 1979. You know, this is. I'm not like I I enjoy his early movies, but I don't. I wouldn't go out of my way to watch them. This is among them. I really do. I really do take more pleasure out of his like more colorful like higher budgeted hollywood stuff but it's a really really angry movie it's a very personal movie and it feels it feels like the product of somebody who in this moment didn't really know what else to do but just overshare in order to sort of relieve the pressure without filter like it's not just oversharing it's oversharing without like without any kind of self-awareness or perspective. It's just, here is my unchecked anger at one particular person who I'm going to literally kill on screen. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh God. You know, it like, he's not the only person to do this. Like 
Dario Argento killed Daria Nicoloni like a million fucking times in his movies. Yeah. So like, I, it's just, it's a thing I think that... the context makes a lot of, uh, the, in, in with regard to that, at least, I think the context makes the difference in this is like, Dario Nicolotti and Dario Argento had a very fiery marriage. Like, but you don't ever get like, you feel like, oh, this is actual misogyny. This is just Italian misogyny. (laughs) Whereas this, you can look at it and say, I can understand why this man is angry. Now, I don't know the details of it, but I do know that it was a very, very bad divorce that, you know, was very painful for everybody and involved a lot of crazy shit. And so I can sort of watch it and think, I get it. I get why you're angry. I get why it's kind of manifesting this way. I wish it wasn't, or I wish there was more insight or perspective on his part, but I understand it. I think it's a really complicated movie. Uh, It's very confrontational and weird and uncomfortable ways. I like that. It's challenging. I like that. It's very like brutally honest. I think that's, that's what put people off of it. I think that's, that's easily it. Like it's, it's got a really gross key moment at the end but as far as Cronenberg movies go, like it's pretty tame. Yeah. It's just the vibe is such a turnoff that, you know, your average your average viewer, you know, who comes out, especially after that stupid trailer that really, really wants to sell you on a horror movie. Right. Like you you don't you don't necessarily get it. You get a divorce drama. For, that's just a product of a very, very angry person. And you watch a man not solve a problem for you know, an hour and a half. Like he's he, at no point does he solve the problem. He ends up killing her in, in the end. Yeah. Like you just watch someone be ineffective when that is not what men were on film at the, at the time. Yeah, that's ah, that's true. That's true. The, the thing that really that really makes this movie valuable is that. This is this is a movie that was made uh, at a really kind of crucial key time for horror as a genre. But while his contemporaries were sticking to tropes, he was doing something that was very unique. Yes. And this movie, there's nothing like this movie. I, I can't think of anything that even sort of approaches it. It's just, it's very unique. It's one of the reasons why. Uh, not in genre fiction, I can't. I mean, I, you can't if you go into like uh, like maybe you know, dramas and shit like that. Yeah. Or, uh, yeah, but yeah, this is this is, like I said, it's not one of my favorites, but. It's one of the reasons that I like Cronenberg as much as I do. Like, this is a dude who just does, is just doing his own thing. Mm-hmm. And I, I really, really love, uh, like, uh, an exotic flavor like that. It's, it's, you can't find this anywhere else. Nope. Love it. Yep. Awesome. So what are we doing next? Oh, speaking of gross, uh, in two weeks, this here, Bring Me the Axe, we'll be back with Reanimator. Oh, uh, Yeah. We're going to do something a lot less sophisticated nope. and way more disgusting, <laughs> way more gross, severed heads. Uh, it's it's going to be great. I can't wait. I can't fucking yeah. wait. That's like one of my all time favorite movies. It's a good one. Yeah. All right. So uh, be back here in a week for another fucking great one that I can't wait to talk about. Man, it's going to be a great two weeks. Yeah. We're next talk- month's really good. Yeah. 99 cent rental. We're doing the Warriors next week. And in two weeks, reanimator.